introduce Jim Campbell. I saw his work for the first time in 2000, um, 13 years ago, and it was a piece called Touching Color that he created in 1999. It was a really um, elegant piece where there was a small um, image being displayed, a moving image, and you would, when you touch the image, um, the entire image would saturate into the color that you were touching. And if you moved your finger around on the surface of the image, you'd basically be moving through the color space of that moving image um, and had correlating sound to go with that. It was a really elegant piece, um, and so that was my first experience with his work. And then in the, work, in the years that have happened since, his work has, has um, moved progressively further into working with light and working with motion in, I think, the most elegant way possible. Um, he's been producing work since 1988, so uh, more than 25 years worth of work exploring video and interaction and light, color, and space. Um, and in my, my opinion, it's, it's the most excellent work. It has sublime effects. Um, and despite the fact, or you know, he, he's a pioneer in the field, but he's still very much leading it. He's very much still at the, at the, the moving edge. He's extremely active right now, working on a number of um, commissions, also putting on solo shows, working on group shows at a really rapid pace. Um, and I'm looking forward to learning more about his work tonight. So please um, help me in welcoming Jim Campbell. Thank you, Casey, for that generous introduction. Um, I'm going to be showing, uh, I guess, as you said, close to 25 years of worth of work today, kind of a scattering from that period, just to show the progression of my work through through that time period. And um, uh, should we wait? Uh, should we hold off on all questions till the end? Is that preferable in terms of? Yeah. So we'll have a question and answer at the end, where I guess a microphone will be passed around. Um, so hopefully you can hold your questions till then. Um, I'm very retro. I'm using a little camcorder up here to show my video. So I first started doing work in the. Um, <clears throat> late 80s, early 90s, about 10 years out of college. And the first works that I did were interactive and used um, closed circuit TV cameras and image processing to create kind of psychological mirrors. In this case, I was interested in creating um, a work kind of on the theme of mental illness, where even if just for a moment you would um, kind of see yourself on fire, uh, even if just for a moment you'd feel like you were mentally ill. Um, as you'll see th watching the documentation, in that regard, the work was a complete failure. It was very entertaining to people. It's almost like they didn't see the fire. They just saw their own image and kind of waved at the, waved at the camera. <laughs> but I have to say, after working for um, there was also a, a virtual woman on the, in the space that was, she was recorded on laser disc and she was kind of layered Heads. into the image. After working for 25 years making art, this first work that I made was actually probably the most Tails. complicated that I ever made. Um, I kind of had to invent this process for creating a, a key in a room without a blue background or without any sort of special background. And up until this Heads. point it hadn't been done, so I kind of had to do something that um, I couldn't just take something off the shelf. I kind of had to figure Tails. out a way how to do it. And this took about, um, in terms of custom electronics, it took about four single rack units worth of electronics. At the time, uh, needless to say, computers were not, I think they ran at 10 megahertz, so they wouldn't be powerful enough to process video images like that. <coughs> Because it was entertaining, this was actually the second variation of the work that I showed. It was too entertaining for what I wanted it to be. I kind of added some things to the processing. For example, I would freeze people's images so that even when they walked away, there would kind of be this burning icon of, the, of themselves still back at the screen. It also kind of took yeah. away the immediate feedback that um, one gets from look, looking at a mirror. This Failed. turned out to be actually more upsetting to people than to see themselves get set on fires, to just see themselves Edge. disappear. 
see themselves go away. So based on the flip of the coin of the virtual woman, the people would either disappear or come back. Tails. The next two kind of show how people, um, it took about eight hours of documentation, but these two clips kind of show how people chose to interact with the virtual woman. You could probably do this work on an iPad now, but it took a lot of electronics in 1990. Um, this work was, was kind of an offshoot of the uh, hallucinations called memory recollection. And it was quite simple. It would just capture uh, your image as a still frame on the left-hand screen. And that image would slowly kind of dissolve to the right, creating kind of a sequence of images. But at the same time, the image would get noisier and noisier. So as the image propagated to the right, it would, um, you'd kind of have a harder time seeing it. But it would also store images. It had a hard, I think it was a 10 megabyte hard drive. Um, and it would store images for e essentially indefinitely, kind of using a um, uh, exponential decay uh, function such that the older an image was, the more chance it would have of being erased by a new image. So the work kind of kept track of its history. When you see the work, you see yourself, but you also see the kind of dozen locations or so where the work was kind of shown at other times and people who have seen it. It used a very simple notion for whether to capture a frame or not. Other than randomness, it would use, it would look for movement in the image so that it didn't, wouldn't catch a bunch of frames of empty rooms. <coughs> This works in a private collection, and when it shows publicly, I'm not totally sure that the collectors really understand that their private lives are slightly shown in the museum, <laughs> kind of going by. <coughs> Digital Watch is another work that was kind of stemmed from the uh, first work, Hallucination. I wanted to create a work that would uh, essentially create a mirror where you would not have control of your body in front of the mirror. So it did that in two ways. One is that the um, image within the face of the watch is delayed five seconds, but it's also um, staccato, so it's once every second updated. So that when you stand in front of the work and you move, your image is moving differently than you are, and it kind of disorients you. And the update rate was kind of based on the ticking of the pocket watch. It involved two cameras, one pointed at a watch and one pointed at the uh, viewers. One of the things that I noticed a lot about these earlier works in the documentation was how people would try to essentially figure out how they worked, but at the same time try to kind of defeat the work somehow, make it not work. And that certainly um, kind of influenced other works. I would spend a lot, I spend a lot of energy on works that are interactive uh, to make them kind of undefeatable. So you might be able to figure them out, but it doesn't mean you can get what you want out of them. This was the first public project, public art project that I did called Ruins of Light. It was at a sports arena in Phoenix, Arizona. And for this work, I created a different kind of electronic key, a different way of mixing the live image with the uh, images off of LaserDisc and off of uh, computer hard drive. And that was essentially a motion key. I would pick up motion of people and um, 
use the motion to figure out where people are relative to the Taco Bell or the Burger King behind them. I took images from uh, stadiums, uh, arenas, coliseums from southern Italy and Greece and brought the columns from these kind of remote locations to this uh, to kind of create virtual columns in the space. The piece itself surrounded the concrete columns in the space. This was an early work, 1992, and one of the things that I spent a lot of time on was trying to figure out how not to have a video work be a rerun in a space so that people would always feel like they were seeing the same thing. And I did that in a couple different ways. One was that the work functioned as a clock and a calendar. Different images would come up at different times of the day and different times of the year. But also I worked with um, kind of you know, laws of combinations and combinatorics and the layering that you're seeing happened in real time so that there's essentially an infinite number of um, or very high number of, possi of combinations possible between the four or five layers that are up on the screen at any one time. I also had a camera inside the bowl of the sports arena that would bring the basketball game out into the, out into the lobby there and mix that in with the kind of pre-recorded imagery also. So after working with um, kind of interactive art for I guess six or seven years at this point, I decided to do a couple works that were anti-interactive. So this work's called Shadow for Heisenberg and as you, uh, it's a cube with a statue inside that's lit from the inside and as you approached the cube, it, the cube would fog up based proportionally on your distance from it. So the closer that you got, the more you wanted to see what was inside the cube, the less you saw. And as you approached it, because it was lit from the inside, the, the object would, the representation of the object would turn into the sh a shadow of the object. <coughs> this is an example of a work that I spent a lot of time making it undefeatable by the viewers. For example, I would have people run up to it or crawl up to it or kind of try to inch up next to it against the wall and um, playing with time constants and things like that so that no matter what they did, they would never be able to read the text that the Buddha was sitting on. I think the only way you would have been able to do it would be with binoculars and a ladder. And no one ever did that. The material you probably all know, but it's, it's currently called privacy glass. It's a material that is used architecturally to fog a window or clear a window. And mostly I just figured out a way to make it continuous, which it isn't normally used that way. <coughs> this was a second work that was kind of dedicated to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, like the previous one, where it's a uh, kind of a life-size projection of these two um, embracing figures at the end of a dark hallway, and as you approach the figures, the, m the closer you get, the more it zooms in to the point of abstraction, so that it's projected onto a pedestal kind of in the shape of a bed, and um, so life-size, effectively. And as you, uh, the closer you get, the more, more it zooms in. Um, up until this point, I'd used a lot of randomness in my work and with this work I kind of took a different approach which kind of a, a big name for it but at the time I thought about it as subliminal interactivity so as you approach this image it would zoom into the part of the image that you approach so for example if you walked in towards the feet of the image it would it would uh, of the figures it would zoom into their feet if you walked in towards their heads it would zoom into their heads and um, I don't think anybody ever figured that out, but that was kind of the point, that there was meaning to what was happening in terms of its progression, 
but it wasn't random and it was unique kind of with each with each viewer each experience when I showed this work in Helsinki and um, uh, a woman walked up to me and said why did it zoom into the man's penis and I said well it zooms into the part of the image that you're walking towards <laughs> and she actually didn't believe me and she went back in and The image was projected kind of onto a bed of salt, um, creating a surface, like a two and a half dimensional surface, uh, almost like the shadow of a bird on the beach. And when you were near it and would walk from one side to the other, the image would actually pan kind of along with you. For the previous work, electronically, I used a camera on the ceiling. For this work, I used um, uh, ultrasonic sensors, uh, 12 ultrasonic sensors on the wall behind the sculpture, behind the pedestal. Um, these next works kind of, if, if those last two works were anti-interactive, I call these next works um, dead interactive works because I used all of the kind of the technology and all of the um, sensors, et cetera, that I had used in my previous works to create interactive experiences, except with these works, they're not, they're not interactive in any way. They're more about recording something and then trying to figure out a way to present those previous recordings. Specifically, I was interested in um, kind of the notion of memories as hidden um, and the analogies between computer memories as computer memory as being this kind of meta thing and human memory as being this meta thing also and so each work is kind of the same uh, structural concept there's a memory kind of stored electronic memory in an aluminum box with a label on it and then a representation uh, coming out from that box in this case it's called um, Photo of my mother is the name of the work, but with the label on the box is my breath and then a certain duration. So there's not kind of a one-to-one -one correlation between the, the memory, if you will, and the representation of the memory. And this work's called Photo of My Father, uh, Portrait of My Father, and um, the uh, recording in the box is a duration of recording my heartbeat. <laughs> so for this work, the um, uh, memory in the electronic box is the complete King James Bible, and then the representation of that memory is me whispering at one letter at a time. So when you walk up to this work, you hear the Bible being uh, whispered one letter at a time. And obviously I didn't whisper the whole Bible, I just whispered the alphabet. And the, um, it's kind of like the, the, the uh, memory of the Bible was kind of playing me. It was like, play this letter now, play this letter now. Um, this is a similar concept, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, and I typed the 26 keys of a typewriter, and so you hear the speech being typed out one letter at a time. The work on the left is called Cyclical Meter, and it's a recording of a woman breathing for, uh, I can't remember, I think it's a two hour period. So it's using, the it's using the clock as representing kind of the accumulation, if you will, of, of her breath. And it's an old-fashioned clock, so it kind of has the continuous analog movement. Um, and the, the second part of this work is uh, called Digital Counter. Um, and uh, cyclical counter, sorry. And it's um, recording the woman's blinking, which is more of kind of a, a digital process. And uh, that's why it used a more contemporary clock that moves once per second.
and for this work, I recorded the power line fluctuations in the wall, kind of like when your refrigerator goes on and your lights dim. Amplified that and um, over an eight hour period on a day when there was an electrocution in uh, Texas. And so you're seeing kind of the fluctuations of the power line from that day modulating that image. Again, I'm using that same liquid crystal display material. In this case, I, I put an accelerometer on my foot walking on the beach. So you're getting kind of a, a simple representation of you know, what my foot was, the pressure on my, the bottom of my feet. Around 1996 or 97, I don't, I can't remember actually, I was invited to give a lecture at MoMA in New York and I had only started, uh, I'd only been making art for about six years and so it was quite an intimidating uh, invitation. I spent about six months getting ready for that and one of the things that I did was I kind of looked at my work and other people's work from the last, you know, eight, ten years before before that, up to that point. And I kind of came up with this um, formula, if you will, for uh, a lot of the work that I had seen and a lot of my own work, which is um, essentially what you're seeing here, this kind of um, essentially series of one-liner artworks, I guess I would call it. Um, and it kind of, uh, it was kind of a changing point in my career. I started thinking that if, if the stuff I'm doing can be defined as one-liners and defined in a formula like this, then it's probably not something that I want to be doing anymore. So kind of creating this, uh, thinking about it this way kind of changed the direction of my work. That, um, diagram is on my website and um, as I said I kind of see it as both a critique and a, also a bit of a joke but so it's a little difficult when I get um, emails from students that kind of say thank you for this formula it will inspire me to make artworks kind of thing <laughs> um, this was a work that I did with Creative Time in New York that actually fits extremely well into the previous formula that I just showed you. It was a, just a simple candle hung at about eight feet with a hidden camera pointing at it. And I generated an extremely loud windstorm based minute, just based on the minute fluctuations of the candle. Um, so it's an, essentially an audio, audio work. Um, and it was kind of an interesting work. It's one of those works, and I have had a lot of those works, where 50% of the people who walk in completely get it, and 50% have no idea what the, what the work is about. Um, if you actually focused on the flame for a little bit and you made the correlation between the wind sound and the flame, it became kind of a meditative piece. If you didn't take it that far or didn't see that correlation, it was kind of a very boring piece. It did become sl a slightly interactive work. The candle was about at about eight feet, and people would jump up and try to blow it out, and that would create this incredible kind of sound in the space. So even though I didn't plan it that way, it's kind of the way that it ended up being. I tried the same work with um, controlling the light in the space versus the sound in the space, and I found that by far the... Um, kind of the transformation of the senses, if you will, taking something that you're looking at and turning it into a, a sound versus just taking an image and magnifying some aspect of that image in the visual realm um, didn't work anywhere near as well as kind of transforming. This is the work that uh, Casey mentioned, uh, or I'm uh, sorry, a related work to the work Casey mentioned a minute ago, uh, or a few minutes ago. It's called Color by Number. And you would see these kind of very large color fields in the space, in this case a hallway, um, James Terrell-like almost. And it, the installation was set up so that you could walk into the closet on the other side of where those color fields were, where they were being generated with video projectors. 
and as you um, and directly across from these two color fields in this kind of little dark room were these two uh, LCD screens with stationary images on them. I should say almost stationary images on them, except for a single pixel that's moving across, scanning scanning the image and mapping that color to the screen that's now behind you. Um, the thought was that by having the screen behind you, kind of your peripheral vision, and seeing this little pixel going through, that it would kind of almost pull you into the screen, make you feel like you were, you were this pixel moving across, slowly scanning the image. This was definitely a work where 50% of the people got it, or maybe 40% of the people got it, and the other 60 had no idea. Uh, they didn't make the correlation between the moving pixel and the large color field behind the, the screens. So um, I took that same idea and decided to create kind of an interactive work. Um, uh, so in this case, it's a projection about 12 inches by 12 inches, very small on the top of a pedestal from below. And as you touch the image, the image disappears and turns into the pixel that you were touching, kind of just like the previous work, except for um, interactive, using your finger instead. Both of these works kind of go back to the, if you will, the Heisenberg notion of the earlier works, uh, of those other two works, meaning that, um, you know, you can, you're exploring the image that you can no longer see. And I specifically made the sound um, out of phase with the, um, not out of sync, but out of phase with the image, so that as the image fades out and turns into a single color, the sound fades up, so it continues to give you cues as to we'll what see. the image is doing that you can no longer see. This work needed about a page and a half of instructions at the doorway, unfortunately, which was definitely one of the failures, I would say, of this work. Um, one of the things that I did like about this work was that it was very game-like, but without um, goals. It was just very exploratory. You weren't really trying to, it was engaging enough to keep you interacting with it, but there was kind of nothing that you were trying to get to. And this was kind of the beginning. These two works were the beginning of my uh, obsession or whatever it has been with the, with the pixel. This is a work that I've only shown once because it's incredibly boring to look at, but I'm showing it now because it um, kind of was a, a changing, another kind of changing point, important moment in my life and in my way of thinking about um, art. In particular, it's a, um, it's a extremely simple algorithm that generates all possible images. Uh, Essentially, whenever it was, 96 or 97, uh, I had gotten my first 24-bit computer card up until that time. I think I just had the amber and green screens kind of thing, or maybe an 8-bit color card. And I started seeing a real image on the computer screen that was kind of as good as a photograph. And it started to make me think about the difference between a digital image and an analog image. And I started thinking that digital images are finite, even though they're extremely large and one cannot even really talk about how large a set of images is, they are finite. Um, so this work will eventually generate any image that you can think of. Will eventually show up on this screen, an image of your birth. Um, just every image will show up on this screen eventually. And that kind of freaked me out, and that, that was another um, <laughs> thing that, I've got some weird thing going on with the projector here and my camera. Um, let's see if uh, resetting it will do. 
I'm plugging it, plugging it in. That started me thinking about moving away from the digital and uh, being an electrical engineer, I started to think about the process of going from, sorry about that, um, going from the analog world to the digital world and what in that process could I kind of explore um, in an analog way but still work with digital, uh, digital images, if you will. And so I started to think about, in this case, uh, filtering that happens both into and out of, anal the filtering that goes, that happens when you take an analog or the real world and you try to bring it into the computer or you take the, something digital in the computer and you try to bring it out, you have to filter uh, the, the signal in that process. Um, and that started me thinking about ways of looking at physically changing digital images. So this is one of the first, this is kind of considered to be the first pixelated digital image made, or one of them anyway. It was done by a scientist at Bell Labs in the early uh, 70s. And what I'm showing you here, it, it, what I started to think about at the same time was the fact that there is no such thing as a digital image that um, if you really look at what the you know, definition of digital is, and I think it's more than just a semantic distinction, um, there's no such thing as a digital image. There are only really di images that at one point were digital. So for example, here you're looking at the same digital information being presented to you two different ways. And you can see how drastically different they look just by uh, looking, playing with kind of the way of taking that digital data and putting it out into the world. And with those two images, you can't really say uh, which one's more accurate. Um, they're just two different ways of representing the same information. <coughs> so that led to this um, kind of series of works that I've been working on for the last 13 years, hopefully with enough variation to make it worth that length of time. Um, this is uh, an 800 pixel image, and what I'm showing here is kind of how filtering out the digital structure uh, makes the image more readable. And I spent some time trying to understand why that's the case, and it seems pretty clear that um, what happens when you look at a pixelated image, particularly of lights, is that your brain um, kind of, is con the, the digital structure is noise to your brain and trying to interpret the image. You can't really see the image underneath the digital structure. So by eliminating the digital structure, then the image becomes more um, recognizable. This is kind of an extreme case. It's a boxing match that is described by 88 pixels. And it takes some people maybe 10 minutes looking at it before they kind of actually realize what they're looking at. And it's the same thing. It's a 88 RGB LEDs um, with a piece of plexi in front of them diffusing out the digital structure. This one I was able to do at a much lower resolution than most of the stuff that I do, and that's because it, I used RGB LEDs. So there's actually three times the amount of information per pixel, if you will. So if I had done this same work um, in black and white, the same image, I should say, um, I probably would have needed at least twice the number of pixels, maybe three times the number of pixels for one to be able to recognize what the image was.
fast forward through this one. So I, I work a lot with um, diffusion filters that are effectively um, in the kind of electrical engineering terminology, uh, reconstruction filters, ways of taking the digitized image and making it an analog one. In this case, the, it's a plexiglass diffuser that's angled close to the LED screen on the left and far from the LED screen on the right. So within the same image, the image gradually goes from a discrete representation on the left-hand side to a continuous one on the right-hand side. So the figures and the, and the uh, cars, the traffic going by are kind of going almost gradually from one representation, if you will, to a secondary type of representation. Another filter that I used to, um, again, to distort, get rid of partly the digital structure. This one consists of a two and a quarter inch piece of resin that has um, small particles, raw pigment suspended in the resin. And so that it's kind of like uh, a uh, flashlight in a smoke filled room. So you're seeing the cones of light coming out from the LEDs as they're kind of creating, creating the image. It's also kind of a way of uh, taking an image that's inherently two-dimensional and kind of making a three-dimensional object out of this two-dimensional image, which is something that I've been exploring in different ways in the last couple of years. It took a year of uh, one of my assistants playing to get the formula right of what was what was actually suspended in the resin so that it didn't um, get rid of too much of the light and had the right amount of dispersion. This, um, in terms of information, goes even further. It's just defining an image by its peripheral pixels. I think it was 52. Um, and then the front of it is just black velvet, so it kind of turns into a void. And this is a work that um, one aspect of it, which I've turned into other pieces since then, is that it's called a fire, a freeway at night, and a walk. And um, if you don't read the title, then you won't know what it is that you're looking at. But if you do read the title, then you do have kind of have a sense of what you're looking at. So it's the kind of minor cues of a few words that help you to, to see the represented image. Um, Montreal, uh, I don't know if they still have it, but in the, they started a festival in the early uh, 2000s where they wanted to bring people out in the winter because people were staying in too much. So they um, d did this festival of light where they uh, had a half a dozen artists or so do light sculptures in a big plaza there. Um, I think it was probably 20 below zero. Um, so I essentially took the notion of my uh, pixelated images and I used light bulbs instead of LEDs and used one foot instead of one inch kind of thing. And um, it kind of worked. It, you, you really couldn't get far enough away. You really wouldn't need it to be about two blocks away to have that image resolved. It ended up being used more as a heater for people than anything else. <laughs> So this is kind of another screen, if you will, diffusing the, the pixel structure, though a more complicated screen. It's a photo, photogravure, photograph of the New York Public Library. So I took a video and a still image of the public library at the same time. And the video is represented behind this rice paper um, 
photogravure and kind of projected through the paper, superimposing the um, the moving figures with the uh, with the library with the photograph of the library, kind of looking at old technology and new technology and mer merging them. Um, ended up with these kind of ghost-like um, figures going in and out of the library. This was the uh, first of the ambiguous icons that I did, and it's called Running Falling. And what I want to try to show you here is how important movement is to these um, low resolution works that I've been working on for a long time. And that images at this low resolution are actually almost completely incomprehensible when they're stationary. And the, the pretty much the main reason that we're able to perceive or, or understand what it is that we're looking at is the fact that they're, they're moving. And that kind of fascinated me because it's certainly not true of, for example, a video image. You freeze a video image, it kind of turns into a photograph. Um, you freeze these works and they become unrecognizable. So that led to kind of a series of works that dealt with, if you will, the motion aspect of low resolution and perception. Um, this was from a series of works of six uh, pe different people who were disabled. It's called Motion and Rest Series. And if you look closely, even though the, the crutches of this person are kind of outside the, oops, outside the resolution of the system, when she's moving, you can actually um, see the crutches, which are probably only about a tenth of a pixel in, uh, in thickness. One of the things I do a lot for the engineers in the audience, if there are any, is uh, play a lot with filtering and I kind of cheat uh, this engineer who came up with this theorem for how to go from analog to digital name, named Nyquist, who kind of says how much information you can go without creating artifacts um, going from the analog to the digital world. So typically what I do is I'll actually let some artifacts come through because it also lets more information come through. And that's kind of what I play with when I do my uh, analog to digital uh, conversions. One of the things that I was interested, uh, that I chose this medium for this topic was that um, one of the things that it does is it kind of um, gets rid of all of the details about the people. You can't tell whether they're men or women or what kind of clothes they have on or hairstyle. Um, it really defines them as kind of uh, creating a signature of them kind of in the physics sense uh, based strictly on their gait. So in that sense, they're perfectly unpolitically correct works because they're defining these people by their disability. Uh, so this work was kind of an experiment. It, it's like a, taking that notion or that hypothesis, probably too big of a word, that these images are understood because it, through their movement, um, this work of ocean waves is a, I think it's a 20 minute cycle. Over a 10 minute period, it gradually slows down and stops. And what I'm doing here is I'm showing you different sections from the different time period, from the different periods of that 10 minute cycle. So if that, you know, theory, if you will, is true, then in the beginning of this cycle, this image will be completely recognizable and 10 minutes later, it's gonna be completely abstract. So just by changing the, um, uh, the speed of the image, uh, it goes from completely representational to completely abstract. One of the things that I 
kind of thought about then was that it kind of low resolution images in a way uh, have a strong connection to audio in that regard to sound. If you take a sound which is inherently defined by movement and you slow it down and you stretch it out, the more you do that, the more the sound becomes abstract because it's defined by movement. And the same is true of um, these low resolution images. <coughs> this is a work, should be sound. There we go. This is a work that drove the gallery nuts, but other than that, um, it's called Self-Portrait of Paul De Marinus. And I recorded Paul's um, voice um, going as l in a low t as low tone as he could to as high tone as he could, and t took a photograph of Paul and uh, created a low-resolution image of that. And so what the work does is it... Um, and on the left-hand side is a... Um, uh, a speaker, the Paul's image is stored in the bottom um, container, if you will, and Paul's voice is stored in the one above it, and I've encoded his image into his own voice speaking these different tones. So the higher the uh, tone would be a white and a low tone would be a black, and then that's transmitted to a microphone that's four or five feet away, kind of a kitty corner in a corner. Um, and trying to capture that information and decode it into this image that's being transmitted using sound. So what would happen is that when a truck would go by or somebody would make a, a loud noise in the space, you would get a black hole in his face or there would be distortion in the transmission. And it really did drive the gallery nuts, but... Um, this was uh, also started out as a series of kind of just experiments, ideas, what would happen if, um, and in this case it's what would happen if if I took all the frames of a video or a film and compressed them into a single image using averaging. And so this is the, the film Psycho. Uh, averaged uh, all, however many, 54,000 frames, averaged to, uh, into a single, single image. And um, because Hitchcock used, uh, this was actually the first one I tried, but it was also in some ways the, the best one I tried. Um, because Hitchcock used very long shots, you can see things like a, a pitcher on the left-hand side and a telephone on the right and a lamp on the right because those images are in the film for probably five minutes. The other image that you can see here that's kind of interesting, that's a, uh, much more abstract, but the first half hour of the movie is Janet Lee driving and a shot of her through the windshield. And if you look at the center of the image, you kind of almost see a skeletal uh, shape with kind of almost two eyes there, and that's kind of the averaging of her. Obviously not as clear as the other things because a, she's moving, and B, the shots of her change a lot. This was the second one that I did, and there's nothing representational at all in the final result because there's no long shots, other than the fact that there were a lot of blue skies in the, in the film. So as with a lot of things that I do, I, after I kind of used existing uh, imagery or found things, uh, I kind of convert, turned that around and I started taking my own videos using the same concept. And I started thinking how they were um, conceptually similar to, not necessarily politically, but conceptually similar to what some of the futurists were trying to do, you know, close to 100 years ago, which was to take uh, time 
and compress it into somehow represent it, representing it either in a photograph or in a painting. So these next few are kind of dedicated to the futurist. This one's called Dynamism of an Automobile and it's a car driving by on the freeway. You're seeing it from the front and the side and the back all at the same time. And this is uh, the same concept with a bicycle. And they, I can't remember, but they're two to three minutes long in terms of the kind of the length, the duration of the video. In this case, the cow was moving and eating and doing a number of different things kind of in the, in the shot. So after making those three images kind of, of from my own footage, what I realized was that the blurriness in the image was equally or more from my camera movement than it was from the um, movement of the bicycle or the movement of the car because there is no frame of reference to kind of match those things. So I kind of flipped the paradigm around and this works called dynamism of an observer. And I stood in front of the clock for an hour holding the camera. And so you're getting two kind of things uh, relating to blurring at the same time. One is my movement. That would be why the numbers, for example, are blurry. And then obviously the clock hands are moving so that, that that's why they're blurry because they're moving. The rest of it's blurry because I was moving. And then this takes that one step further to um, nothing in this image was moving and I kind of, I didn't stand there. I, I uh, squatted down and filmed this for 90 minutes. I think probably the, the one thing that I noticed about these last uh, six works, kind of in retrospect, was how many students and artists that I've met in the last uh, 13 years that were exploring damn near identical concepts in right around 2000, like within a two year, two to three year period. Um, you know, there were probably 200 <laughs> artists out there where it's almost like that was the time when uh, you know that shift happens happened where uh, a moving image is an object and what do you a, a moving image is data and what do you do with data kind of thing and before that because all of these works that I just showed you could have been done 40 years ago. They could have been done with uh, photographic still cameras. I mean, there are a reason why maybe not in the extreme sense they couldn't have, but certainly uh, they could have and they weren't. They were all done right around the year 2000. And I find that really fascinating that it was a very short time period. Um, I mean, I, I think a year after I made the psycho piece, I visited uh, VCU and there was a student who was doing exactly the same thing with exactly the same film, like a year later. Um, anyway, I, mostly what's interesting about that is that it really happened, a change happened in a very short period of time. Um, and this it looks awful because of the projector distortion, so I'll just fast forward it. Um, but what I was playing with there was kind of a different notion of how many images can you uh, superimpose on top of each other before it goes uh, abstract. And I can tell you the answer is about 14. Um, and I did a series of works that kind of dealt with that. So this, as I showed before, is um, 200 pixels uh, defining the image of this running figure. This is 48 defining the image of this running figure, which I think if I tell you it's a running figure, you can probably see it, though it's kind of hard. It's getting, getting near the realm of being unrecognizable. And this is a, a single 
pixel of that same running figure. Um, and if you see a running figure in that, then I would be impressed, because I don't. Um, and the first thought with that might be, it's because there's a not enough information there to kind of represent, uh, say, a running figure. But I started thinking about um, that around this time and going back to kind of some of the earlier works that I'd done with the heartbeat and the, the um, breathing and kind of realized that um, the reason that that single pixel, for example, I isn't representing the running figure is because of the way that it was created. It was created based on simply compressing an image of the running figure. But clearly there's other information, if you will, other rhythms that might, um, might be able to present that in a better way. The compression of an image is not, um, or the, the kind of shrinking of it. And that led to this work, which is called Last Day in the Beginning of March. And it was a, um, these 25 circles of light projected onto uh, a very large gallery floor, about three feet wide. Each one um, in their own rhythm, each circle of light was creating its own kind of time-based uh, progression, rhythm, if you will. Um, and together, and each of these circles of light had a, um, uh, a little two or three word text nearby telling you what, what the rhythm was that you were looking at. And together they kind of created a poem that was based on the last day of my brother's life. So for example, this one's um, I think called Walking Back and Forth. Um, and one of the kind of interesting things that um, I noticed when I tried to create these 25 different rhythms, whether it was the windshield wipers on his window or his car radio playing or, um, or the refrigerator noise in his uh, trailer, was that the way to get, the way to kind of get the, uh, evoke uh, the rhythm of something is generally speaking, the best way to do that is not to record it and then play it back. It's to actually figure out some way to do it more expressionistically. Um, and so that led me to kind of this way of generating rhythms, which is drawing them in time, kind of almost like an oscilloscope. So for example, walking is a good example. I tried many different ways of trying to get the, the subtle rhythm of someone walking, and I ended up just uh, drawing it kind of as a, as a light level representation over time. So in that way, the rhythms are fictitious, um, if you will. Um, and that was kind of something that I became fascinated about with the work, is that it's, it's a poem about a real event, um, but each of the individual rhythms are fictitious in that they're drawn. I should say they're expressionistic also. So together they kind of create a narrative of that day. This is a telephone ringing and being answered. So it's it, one of the things about that work that obviously became extremely important was the, the text. 
Otherwise, you would have walked into this room with 25 lights that were each kind of doing their own thing, and it's not that it wouldn't have any meaning, but it would be relatively abstract. So the text was used um, kind of as uh, cues to, um, it's hard to describe, not so much as you know telling you what to look for, but just to kind of set the ambience for the, for the work or for the rhythm. Um, it, it, it was an interesting work because it, um, I think, it was, uh, if you you'd, uh, could only call it a work of visual art, but it, the, your response to it was anything but visual. In fact, it was more about peripheral, if anything. It was more about feeling the presence of something in there with all the rhythms happening than it was about looking at 25 lights that were just changing. And I think that's because of the kind of simplicity. There was only 25 kind of very slow single streams of information there. For this work I wanted to create a clock that you didn't have to set. So it has um, a nothing more than a light sensor that, go, that is set outside and it gradually phases itself to the rhythms of the, of the sun. So eventually, like it takes two or three days um, when this hits, it gives you the percentage of the day gone. So at 99.999, that would be sunset, and then it goes around at night to uh, the same thing in the day, uh, from midnight to, to uh, not from midnight, from morning to, uh, from night to morning, from sunset to sunrise, also goes from zero to 99.99. Was kind of, it has a couple interesting, you know, artifacts or aspects to it, which is, which are that it, it, it's basically like people. I take it to a new location, I install it. It takes three or four days before it has jet lag, essentially. Um, and the other kind of interesting thing about it, which I didn't know when I was making it, is uh, I'm sure a lot of you have read a lot about kind of the history of time and the history of clocks. But cl hours were originally defined by actually sunset to sunrise and sunrise to sunset, and breaking that up into an equal uh, twelve equal uh, amounts, so that the length of an hour actually changed uh, from winter to summer, for example, and it had more to do with prayers. Um, so this work has that same notion. It speeds up a lot in the daytime in the winter, and it slows down in the daytime in the summer. And this is kind of another play at um, making a distinction between concept and representation like those earlier works. So this is the same work that I just showed you. Um, and the woman is in sunrise position now. And at sunset, she will be answering the phone and it, so it takes her um, on a you know, typical day in October or whatever, September, takes her 12 hours to kind of make that, make that journey. So this is what it looks like at noon. So you can't actually see her move. She's just moving very slowly. created a series of works that um, kind of mixed two notions that I was interested in, back to the Heisenberg notion um, and also the low resolution. So in this case, it's a series of suspended pixels in these kind of columns facing the wall. So each pixel is projecting its light onto the wall. But the only way to see the image is by looking through the display device, is by looking through the little set of circuit boards that are there, unless you look at it from the extreme side like this, and then it's obviously extremely abstract. So the, the um, image that's the display device is, is um, getting in the way of, of viewing the image.
these were all um, this whole series of works. There's a eight or nine of them. I think I'm showing one or two, uh, two here. Um, we're all from home movies, uh, mostly from eBay, from the as old as the 30s to um, the mid to late 70s, kind of when uh, VHS started to take over. So one of the things that happened um, with these, one of the reasons that I chose home movies, and there's some of you in the audience that have seen them, I presume that are my age, um, it was that I was shocked at how every home movie I got from eBay kind of looked alike, didn't matter where it was from in the United States. You know, it all, they all had Niagara Falls, they all had birthday parties. So one of the things that happens with these works, because they're low resolution, and because home movies were so typical, is they kind of become universal. When you see these, I should say if you're my age or maybe 10, 15 years younger, when you see these, they could be your home movies. I mean, they really, they were that similar. And the, the works themselves get rid of kind of just enough resolution so that um, there's no specifics in the images that you're looking at. This work, uh, I think, is about 12, it's hard to tell, but it's about 12 by 16 feet. The last one was about 4 by 5 feet. It's getting a little late. I'm going to fast forward through a couple of public artworks. Maybe I'll show a little bit of this one. I, one of the things that in the last few years that I've been interested in is kind of uh, exploding an image, taking it off, uh, taking it off the the wall, making it more um, three dimensional and more uh, uh, more three dimensional. Um, so in this case, the work consists of this uh, kind of grid of cubes presenting an image uh, of ocean waves. It's at UCSF in San Francisco, which is near the ocean called Ocean Mirror. But conceptually, if you took out, or structurally, if you took out the seven uh, horizontal row of cubes in this work, I mean in this screen, and you spread them around, and I spread them around the, um, this kind of garden area, so that when something happens in the image, um, you kind of see the whole garden you kind of see it happen in the whole garden at the same time. It's kind of a stretching, if you will. So you're actually seeing the, the waves in these kind of individual pods. They're kind of broken apart and spread out. One of the things that happens with that, which is, as you can probably tell by now, is it, it, it extracts something from the image, and what it extracts by doing that is the rhythm. Uh, some aspect of the rhythm of the image, um, some essential rhythm of the image, I should say, if, if it's successful. So you're seeing these pixels on the ground or a group of pixels on the ground, but they are, um, but you can't really see the image, but you can kind of feel it, I guess would be the other way to say it. And this work um, takes that kind of in a slightly different direction. I um, took a wooden chair apart and uh, work with a glass guy and we completely recast the chair out of 17 different elements uh, in glass. And the chair sits in front of this low resolution image and um, I, I forgot what you guys calling it. It's not a texture mapping but I had two projectors pointing at the image and again, because I wasn't really interested in doing the um, kind of the Mike, Mike Neymark thing where I'm mapping an image to the chair, I was more interested in mapping, if you will, the, s some aspect of the image to the chair, in this case, the rhythm. So each of the 17 elements of the chair were actually just representing a single pixel of the image. 
So for example, when a figure would walk across the screen, it would feel kind of like a shadow would walk across the chair because there's, there's almost no information there. But there's enough information there to kind of, again, have you get a sense of what, what's happening. This had two projectors pointing at it from kind of kitty corner angles. And as it seems like some of you guys have played with the same thing, it took two or three days to create the masks and hope that the projectors didn't move after we created the masks. After spending two years making that, somebody actually sat on it in the gallery and broke it. And I almost started crying when I got that from the gallery. Um, for many years, I'd wanted to create a work. Um, you've probably heard me talk about it. Very interested in peripheral vision, I think, because of its primalness. Um, and in fact, a, a lot of the low resolution works for me are kind of um, connected to primal vision. Um, because they are eliminating all of the kind of analytical stuff that your brain is usually involved in when you're looking at an image, the edges, the colors, this, that. It's just there's this very simple information coming through. Um, so this work, what I was trying to do was to create a uh, kind of a representation of peripheral vision. So it's the same technology that I showed earlier with the suspended pixels, but it's very high density on the left-hand side and low density on the right-hand side. So it goes from kind of high resolution to low resolution. And it's just a, a taxi ride in New York, and um, I kind of, it, it felt like pointing out the window of a, you know, the passenger side of a car is, uh, whether we're aware of it or not, is probably one of the times that your peripheral vision is most activated with all of that motion going by. So it seemed like the kind of the, the perfect uh, match for the content of this, this image. This was tricky because all of the pixels on the left, um, what you can't tell here, but hopefully it's obvious, um, is that on the left-hand side, they are um, only about a half inch away from the wall, and on the right-hand side, they're about 18 inches away from the wall. Again, so that the image is kind of just filled in. And because of that, the, the LEDs on the right-hand side are about you know, 100 times brighter than the ones on the left-hand side to create the same perceived amount of light. And this is the last work I'm showing. It's a public art project that I did in uh, Madison Square Park in New York. And the, the notion here was to take a two-dimensional image and stretch it into three dimensions. And so it's made out of, uh, what was it, uh, 1,600 light bulbs uh, in this kind of two-dimensional, three-dimensional matrix, um, but it, it's effectively a two-dimensional image. Um, and for example, if you saw this image and it was perfectly aligned from, say, you know, half a mile away, what you would see is a perfect XY grid of lights. Yet when you look at it from the side, it's randomly spaced and 12 feet deep. So once you start getting beyond about 15 degrees off axis, the image is incomprehensible because um, it kind of, it's pointing a certain direction. And when you're looking at it from the side, you can't look at an image from the side, so, or a two-dimensional image. This work went through the, uh, the the fifth worst winter New York ever had with these actually light bulbs that were just kind of floating there. Um, and we broke about 600 in that period. Um, 
but you know I was afraid after we installed it and we saw the winds that it could easily break all of them kind of in one day so I, I thought in that regard it was pretty successful. Um, for that work we took all the, uh, I shouldn't say we, I should say my assistants took apart 2,000 light bulbs and put LEDs inside um, so that instead of renting a semi-truck generator, semi-truck trailer generator, the whole work drawed um, less power than a half of a toaster oven. And I will end there, and hopefully we have some questions with a microphone. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, uh, it, as, as somebody who works a lot with, um, you know, so you're an artist and you're an engineer, so you're working a lot with highly technical media. And I know in my experience, it's really easy to get very distracted and kind of down into a wormhole of just <laughs> futzing with something that's that's <laughs> highly highly technical. Too, yeah. um, so, can you talk a little bit about sort of how you balance, you know, your ideas and your artistic vision against the sort of um, black hole of technical yeah, complexity? Yeah. Um, I think, if, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever gotten asked that question before. It's a good question. I think I kind of end up breaking it up schedule-wise almost into three parts, and it ends up working best that way because it's about focusing, changing, focusing again, and changing and focusing again. And those three parts are kind of concept, what I want to do. Um, and then that gradually fades into how to do it. And then I just you know, write my hardware code in Verilog for a couple months, um, depending on what it is. Um, and then usually what happens, and I'm, you probably have the same experience, is that process will slightly change, you know, the original concept. And maybe it's because I'm an engineer, or maybe it's just because I'm a nerd. I, sometimes I have a hard time, I'm better now than I used to be, of going with that change, even if it kind of seems, seems better. Um, and then the end result is actually putting it all together and then, you know, if you will, most of the work kind of fits into that, putting the content into it and then exploring that. Kind of the interesting thing and the difficult thing of the low resolution works in particular is that most images don't work in that realm. They have to have a certain, certain characteristics to them. So they're very limited, unfortunately. Um, and so I might have an idea and I'll, build something and I'll try it and it just doesn't work. It just, it technically doesn't work. So it's kind of going back and forth. But what I do find and what, you know, as advice, what the advice that I would give is to not go back and forth between kind of the creative and the electronic creative on the same day or even necessarily in the same week is to kind of give yourself blocks to do that because it's really hard to kind of shift gears and stay focused and, um, so, I didn't repeat the question. Was I supposed to repeat? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, hi. So, since you seem to be use or since your thinking seems to be quite um, sort of like centered around signal signals and signal processing in a way, um, is, is is there some sort of like new or if you were to make sort of completely new work now, would there be some sort of like technical advancement or scientific advancement in, in this field that you would sort of like consider investigating? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think I have two answers for that. One is that I worked in Silicon Valley for 20 years and uh, de designing uh, chips, ICs that did um, ironically high definition TV kind of image processing to kind of make images look better, to kind of enhance and noise reduce and things like that. And one of the reasons that I started doing this kind of work was to kind of get away from high tech because, um, and kind of relates to your question, is that because otherwise you're going to get stuck with the technology. I mean, just go with what's there. And um, the second answer to the question, I think, is that, and I don't know if this is because I'm an engineer or just conservative, but I commonly find that um, 
I never try to do something that I actually, on some level, don't know that I'll be able to figure out how to do. So I'm not waiting for a technology that doesn't exist. Um, once in a while, and not so much recently, but early on, I have to invent a technology to create an effect, like the fire piece with the difference key. But um, so I don't know if that answers your question. But yeah. um, can I, if I can ask a second one? Um, sort of like recently, sort of like at least from the example that uh, that you've shown. Um, the pieces seem to be more about something that is recognizable rather than sort of the abstract single pixel on the wall. Um, would you cons sort of like, is this for you a sort of a criteria of success that, uh, that the audiences should be able to sort of like have the moment where they say like, okay, I, I, I see something? Um, or is this sort of like for you, like both way would be a success if someone, you know, doesn't see the image? Um, but sort of like a bunch of flickering lights. Um, is, is this sort of, yeah, for you still, still it's a piece? It's a good question. Um, again, it's possibly uh, a, a limitation of just the way I think or being an engineer is I've generally speaking have never liked artwork that's completely abstract. And so I don't make artwork that's completely abstract. I always want some kind of reference, reference back. Um, uh, for example, a color field painting that had a name that give, gave me a way in, I, I, I have a relationship to. Um, and so, um, uh, yeah. But to w one kind of, some anecdotal uh, answers to that are um, uh, some of the public works, like the work at Madison Square Park or a work that I did, just did at SF MoMA, I'm definitely thinking about them as at least being partially recognizable. And because it's impossible to really simulate those works, I actually don't know 100% if they're going to work when I'm finished. So when I first plug them in, it's and uh, it's uh, every time except for once. <laughs> it's been a relief that it's kind of as recognizable, at least as I w wanted it to be. Um, but the other thing is I, I am working, heading more towards um, kind of the work that I showed last day in the beginning of March with the circles of light, which was certainly the most abstract work that I've done. And I am, am kind of heading more in that direction of, of simple, I guess I would say, or simple representations or more kind of primal relationship to what it is that you're kind of looking at. Um, okay, so my question is kind of about how you're using art and technology, and then what? Sorry, I didn't. Just it's just um, relating yeah. to how you do you, you you know doing art with these technologies, new technologies, and how do you kind of wrangle you know the artistic idea and then putting that into you know these abstract forms in, of light? Like, what's your process when you? when you come up with something in your mind like of what you want to do and then how that process kind of yeah. unfolds, you yeah. know, and. Um, usually, uh, again, maybe it's because I'm an engineer. I'm using that phrase a lot tonight. I usually don't. Maybe it's related to the questions. Um, I think about something, unfortunately, for two or three years commonly um, before I actually do it. And uh, again, back to your question, hopefully because I've thought about it for so long, I'll still be open to changes in the process. Um, but one of the things certainly, for example, a number of the, the low resolution works that I showed, I created this technology 10 years ago, at least the ones that are kind of the typical with the panel on the wall and so I can, that's kind of, you know, a computer screen for me now. I don't need to redesign that. I can just think about what kind of images, images that I'm interested in putting into that. Um, and I can 
download them, you know, in five minutes into the work, and I have a, a new and different work. Um, and in some ways, that's been going on too long, which is why I'm doing these works that have to be one-offs just by the way that I'm defining them, because it's it's uh, kind of more engaging and more fulfilling, like the work at Madison Square Park, for example. And for that work, um, because I, you know, I'd never seen any work like that where you take an image and you stretch it out in the Z dimension and will it still be recognizable? So we actually built a, you know, a functioning maquette that was essentially this big um, just out of little suspended LEDs to see, to see if it would work. Um, and then, you know, stand, this is where it kind of gets fake, stand two feet away and pretend that's, you know, 50 feet away and you know, forgetting about stereo vision and all that. It just, there's no way of kind of predicting, but I did do a, kind of a, a sample of that. And then spending, in that case, four months on just technology, you know, the ideas there, put that away for a while, and then explore technology. And through that process, then I start to think about what kind of imagery I might want to use on it. And then, um, so that by the time the technology's done, I'm kind of ready to play with some imagery. But I do, um, because of my process and because there's this, for those kinds of works, there's this long uh, technological uh, process. Uh, unfortunately, I, uh, I'm deadline driven, so kind of towards the end, I'm always in a hurry when I'm trying to kind of figure out what imagery will work with this thing, and unfortunately, I don't generally leave myself enough time for that. But because of the, um, again, the, if you will, the primalness or the, the simpleness of the low resolution works, uh, figures, for example, work the best and uh, other, other kinds of images that are just extremely simple in their movement. Thank you.